Thank, thank you all for joining us tonight for another eye-opening session of Basic Science Lights the Way. Tonight's talk on artificial intelligence covers an issue that is top of mind for all of us in higher education. Uh, the newest generation of large language models and generative uh, artificial intelligence tools have forced us here at Berkeley and all over the world uh, to suddenly and dramatically rethink our approaches uh, uh, in a way. At this point, I doubt there is a single professor at Berkeley who hasn't considered how AI affects their work as an instructor and researcher. You've likely read stories about educators who worry about students cheating by presenting AI-generated content as their own without learning the underlying concepts. While those concerns are real, many professors at UC Berkeley are also experimenting with how uh, to use AI in the classroom and in the laboratory for discovery. How do we elevate digital literacy so students use AI safely and responsibly? How can researchers use AI to streamline routine tasks, sift through large, large amounts of data, and recommend the most promising areas to explore? These questions are amongst the grow, uh, going to remake our institutions across the world and how we operate. So I'm very eager to know the directions in which these speakers tonight are leading us. Once we're underway, to reiterate a point just made, I hope you will post your questions for any of our speakers in the chat box. We will answer as many of them as we can. You see many of us are using AI with our cell phones uh, right here. That's an AI instrument. Our moderator this evening is Sandrine Dudois, Professor of Statistics and Public Health. Sandrine is an Associate Dean for the Faculty and Research in the, Co in the College of Computing and Data Science and Society. Uh, Professor Dudois' methodological research uh, is interested, uh, interests regard high dimensional statistical learning and include exploratory data analysis, visualization, unsupervised learning, loss-based estimation with cross-validation, and casual inference, causal inference. M much of her work is motivated by statistical questions arising in bio biological and medical research, and in particular, the design and analysis of high-throughput sequencing gene expression studies and precision medicine. For instance, she has developed methodology for discovering novel cell types and for the study of stem cell differentiation in the mammalian brain using single cell transcriptome sequencing. She's also a founding co-developer of the Bioconductor Project, an open source and open development software project for the analysis of biomedical and genomic data. In recognition of her work, Dudois was elected as a fellow of the American Statistical Society in 2010, became an elected member of the International Statistics Institute in 2014, and is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, uh, first elevated to that position in, two, in 2021. We're delighted to have you uh, here this evening as our moderator, Sandrine. Uh, so now over to you, and I'll mute myself. Thank you, Dean Bachan. I'm excited to be here as the host for tonight's Basic Science Lights the Way event. As mentioned, tonight we will hear from Berkeley scientists about how artificial intelligence informs their work and makes mind-blowing science possible. There's no question that AI touches almost every aspect of life, and its transformative power only continues to grow. As Dean Bachan mentioned, my research focuses on developing and applying statistical learning methods and software to analyze biomedical and genomic data. In particular, I've recently begun to work on spatial transcriptomics, where we can measure genome-wide expression levels, both at the resolution of single cells and with the spatial location of these cells within tissues. 
This unprecedented resolution and throughput allows us to address new questions in basic science as well as in precision medicine. For instance, with the new field of computational pathology, we can have a multi-omic view of tissue samples by leveraging the digitization of standard microscopy slides, along with high throughput spatially resolved measurements of gene expression and protein levels. This holds the promise to revolutionize disease prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. However, in order to reap the benefits from this new wealth of data, it's critical, it's, we depend critically on our ability to reliably and efficiently analyze these data. Well, is AI the answer? One cannot open a scientific journal or call for grant proposals without running into various forms of AI, whether it's neural networks, deep learning, or large language models. There's AI for astronomy, AI for climate, AI for medicine, et cetera. And by the way, what is AI exactly? So I was thrilled to be invited to moderate this panel to learn how colleagues leverage AI in their respective disciplines. I'm particularly curious to hear what question AI has allowed them to address that they were not able to address before. I'm also curious to hear how they each define AI. So at the end of each talk, we'll try to address all of the questions from the audience. So please add your questions in the chat. Our first speaker is Professor of Physics and Neuroscience, Mike DeWeese. Professor DeWeese's research spans three broad areas, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, machine learning theory, and systems neuroscience. Deep neural networks have enabled technological wonders from machine translation to image generation. But remarkably, nobody has a principled understanding of how they work and what they can do. To fill this gap, Professor Deweese is working on developing first principles theoretical understanding of neural nets and related machine learning methods, often finding use for tools and concepts from statistical physics. Mike, thank you for joining us this evening. What would you like to share? Uh, thanks for that nice introduction, Sandrine. Um, uh, I, so as you say, Gabby, uh, my group works on uh, physics, and we do neuroscience, and we do um, machine learning. And I'll, you know, let me just put my slides up here. Mm -hmm. Oops, I think that's not the right one. Sorry, let me do that again. Got the wrong window. So we do, we work in all three of those areas. And in fact, we ask, uh, we ask questions that are influenced by the other areas. We'll take ideas from physics and we'll use it to develop as you just as you just described, we'll use that to develop um, uh, tools for AI. Let me see here. Oh, I'm almost there. There's my slide. There we go. Does that look okay? Um, and yeah. and uh, here, let me show you a graphic of this. So yes, we think about the brain. We think about artificial neural networks, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And we think about uh, thermodynamic systems, this physics, and these ideas all inter uh, interact with each other. And it's true, we have been developing first principles theories for why neural networks work as well as they do, and for developing better tools for engineers and for scientists to use AI. What I'm gonna talk about tonight is gonna be, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna talk so much about the physics aspect of this, uh, of my lab's uh, work. Right? I'm gonna focus on interactions between the, our work in the brain and our work in artificial neural nets. And I'm gonna give examples in both directions where ideas from over here influence our, our theories about the brain and how the brain might work and ideas from the brain, uh, how they inform us about how we can develop better tools for, um, for artificial intelligence. So uh, to get started, I'll talk about the brain a little bit. Uh, the brain, uh, this is a human brain right here. Uh, this is for a person to be facing to your left. And the, I, my title here, the phrenologists were right, well, phrenologists were the 19th century folks who, I'm not even sure if they were really scientists, but they had this idea that bumps in your head could determine your personality. 
it turns out that's not really true, but they were right that there is specialization in the brain. Some parts of the brain are involved in vision. Some parts are involved in audition and, and so on. Um, I'm going to focus on vision tonight as my example, but, um, but it turns out that the entire brain, the outside of it, the cerebral cortex, is where a lot of the thinking, a lot of the computation goes on. Um, and here's a, a, a flattened, if you, if you take, this is actually not a human brain, this is from a, a monkey. Um, if you flatten out the brain and look at all the different regions, the, the colored regions here are involved in vision. There's like 30 or 40 different areas that are dedicated to vision in, uh, in, a, um, in a, a primate brain. Um, and you can think about it a little bit like a switchboard. These different areas, how do they interact with each other? Well, you've heard of white matter probably and gray matter. Gray matter is the outer part of our, our brain, our cerebral cortex. It's, it's gray because the cell bodies of the neurons actually make it look gray. And the white part is where the wires go, if you want to think of it that way. The, the parts of the neuron that sticks out and connects to other neurons and allows them to communicate and make an actual network. So it's a neural network, right? Um, if I have two different areas of this brain, um, uh, of, this, of the cortex, maybe they're both visual areas, whatever they are, um, one of them might receive direct input from somewhere else, maybe from the eyes, right? Or from, the, or from places the eyes talk to. And they can talk to each other, as they say, like a switchboard, where there's connections that go from one area to another through this white matter. So, um, oh, and also I, I've indicated on here, you can see that I've drawn my little, little cartoon of cell bodies. They tend to line up in layers. It tends, they tend to be structured in terms of where they're located and the different types of cells actually uh, are differentiated a little bit. You tend to see one kind of cell up here, a different kind down here. So people have uh, started seeing this around 100 years ago when they were first able to, to stay in the brain. Oh, and here's another picture of a brain. Now we're seeing it from the side. Uh, person's eyeballs looking this way. Information comes into the eye. Here's the retina back here. The information then goes to uh, the thalamus, uh, it, just a structure inside the brain. And that projects to the visual cortex in the back of our head, right? And in fact, is the primary visual cortex, V1, the first of all the visual areas. Um, and if I just take a little piece of this and in, cro in cross section and say, what does that look like? These are just, on the last uh, slide, I showed you a cartoon of these layers of cells. Here I'm showing it to you that, um, where you can see a little more, little more granular uh, structure of what it looks like. Um, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter, you might see more or fewer layers. It's not so well defined, but there's something like six sort of groupings of, of neurons, six layers throughout the cortex. And if we blow up one of these neurons and ask what these things look like, a neuron actually, um, well, they're, of all the cultures in the earth, the only one I, uh, in, in the uh, history of the human race, the only one I know of that puts arrows arrowheads backwards are neuroscientists, because it turns out that a lot of the cells have a, a triangular shape. Um, and so here's a proper arrow that's saying the direction that the, the information goes. Um, here's the cell body, which is a triangular shaped neuron, a pyramidal neuron. Um, it gets information from its dendrite, which is a fancy word for the input. And it has an output on the other side, the axon. This axon of these wires I'm talking about that are being projected throughout the brain that connect different neurons uh, to one another. The dendrites do a little of that, but the axons go a little further. They tend to be the thing that connects. And it turns out that the way we send information from one neuron to another in our, in our cortex uh, involves all or none events. It's sort of a digital, almost a digital like code. This is a, uh, this thing is an action potential. It's a, a spike in voltage as a function of time. And it's often referred to as a spike. Um, and I'm just gonna show a little animation of it moving its way down. So it travels down the axon. And then if there's a downstream neuron that's listening to this one, and typically there are about 10,000 neurons listening to any neuron that it's connected to, um, there might be a synaptic connection here. And if I, uh, this synapse here is the way they communicate with one another. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but it turns out there's a lot of interesting chemistry and biology that happens here. Um, but as I say, there's a lot of details and you can see I keep blowing it up more and more. So when people started thinking about artificial neural nets and whether we could sort of build a machine or build or simulate a machine even on a, on a regular old computer, that can have some of the nice properties the brain has and the computational abilities. They wondered, well, what details should we keep and what should we discard? And so it, 
mostly what people do is don't worry about all these details inside the neuron. They, they tend to use very simple neurons, as I'll describe in a minute, and they just worry about the fact that you have a lot of these things that are connected to one another. But here again, there's a lot of the connection st structures in the brain is very complicated. So let's go back to our picture we had a minute ago of our the surface of the of our brain, the cerebral cortex. And there's the switchboard happening here. Let's say we've got visual input coming up, and maybe this is V1, the, the primary or the first place in the visual in the cortex that processes visual information. Maybe it's talking to another area of V2, it's next in line. This is this is obviously a pretty simple cartoon, but it's not, it's to first order or, or to a good approximation. This is the right initial way to think about it, even if it doesn't capture all the details. The information comes in, it gets processed here, and then it goes to the next area and the next area and so on. As I said before, there's like 40 or so different uh, V somethings, uh, you know, visual areas in our cortex, and they have around six or so layers a piece. So you can imagine stacking this thing up in a hierarchy, and that's what um, people wanting to, to think about artificial neural networks did. They said, okay, let's let's make a let's make a simple um, sort of cartoon of this where I'm just arranging them horizontally, where the information flows from left to right. Here are the six layers of neurons that are, correspond to the six layers here in V1. Here's this. I didn't show them all because I ran out of space, but you can imagine what I'm doing here. I stack them all up. And I'm going to have a fully connected feed forward deep net deep because it's got lots of uh, lots of layers. Like I said, it would be over 200 if we were to add up all the, you know, six times 40. I was talking about a minute ago and it's feed forward because we assume that all the connections go from left to right. So that's the simplest sort of a network we could imagine. Um, well, I guess it's not the simplest. The simplest would just be a single layer, which is the first thing people studied, but then deep nets became interesting. And uh, so we had many more layers, but it's simple in the sense that all the connections go to the right. There's no recurrent or feedback connections here, unlike the real brain, which does have those kind of connections, even though those don't form the majority, most of it's feed forward. And so that's our, that's our simple model for the brain. And here I've highlighted my deep and my feed forward. Um, and here's a little picture of it. Another thing we uh, that people did when they first started cooking up these artificial neural nets is they said, let's forget all the details inside the cell. Let's say that neurons consist of these things that just have a single number that represents how active they are right now. So instead of counting up all the spikes, or remember those red action potentials I was I was talking about that they send to each other, instead we'll just have a single number. Um, and oh, and here's my... If for, for a visual uh, circuit, you'd have an input here. It only has two neurons for simplicity, but you can imagine many more. Each of these represents maybe a single pixel in the image, right? And then these arrows are a little small, but they, each of these is pointing to the right, these little gray arrows. And I've got only three instead of 40 or 200 or whatever layers just to make it easier to look at. And there's some output, which might consist of just a few neurons or many. Um, and... Uh, I won't get into the math, but just for fun, I've I put the in 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 lighter color. There's there's a couple numbers I need to to do to represent what this network does. One is I have to say how active a given neuron is, and for the input layer, that just means how bright is that pixel? Is it bright? Is it dark? That tells you what the number is that represents the activity of this neuron. And then what determines this guy's activity? Well, it's going to be the weighted sum of activities on the previous layer in the network. You just multiply the number associated with the weight or the connection strength between this non and this neuron times the activity here, and you sum it up for all, in this case, only two, but sum that, that weighted sum for those two activities, and then you put it through a nonlinearity, some function. I've got a couple candidate nonlinearities. They're not straight lines. It turns out if you just have straight lines, the brain is is not your neural neural network won't be very powerful, but if you put some wiggles in it, if they're nonlinear, um, then it turns out you can you can produce it turns out very powerful um, computational devices by just stacking these things up. Even though there's not much complication in here compared to all the stuff we might see if we look closely at real neurons in the brain. So this is the this is a a very this a very simple idea. Um, it turns out it's very powerful. Um, 
Oh yeah, and as I mentioned, the, everything here is captured by just a number for each the activity of each of these neurons at one moment in time, and the, a number for the connection strength between pairs of neurons. And you know the amazing things that started happening about ten years ago, right when neural networks, you know, and artificial intelligence was able to identify cats in photos. It was based on networks that aren't that different from the one I just showed you. Pretty simple. Um, and the learning rule, which I didn't show you explicitly, the mathematical rule for, rule for that, essentially just said you want to minimize your errors and you and it's supervised. So you show cat. So you, you have a bunch of photographs, some with cats and some without cats. You have humans label them and then you train your network on these things um, that have already been labeled by humans so that we know what the answer is. And eventually um, by by and essentially, how do you do that? Well, I'm not going to go into the math, but essentially you take a derivative and use the chain rule, if you remember that from your calculus class, and that tells you how to change all those little weights, because the weights are the things that you turn and change. Those are the parameters of your model. The, the connection strengths, those weights, that's what, it, what you learn in deep learning. Those are the things you change. And once you've trained the network up, it does all kinds of near magical things. It can identify cats. Uh, it recently beat the, the, the Go master. Um, with a fancier architecture than I showed you, but not that much fancier. Um, and now even we've got, you know, just in the last couple of years, you know, Dolly can generate uh, very convincing looking images based on text input. And now we have chat GPT, which was mentioned in the intro there. You know, all these things have become possible based on networks that aren't that much more complicated than the, the one I showed you a minute ago, even though we left out a lot of the biological complication. So one thing that, I'm interested in doing and in, in my lab, in addition to developing tools um, like the ones that do those fancy things, uh, nice engineering tools, we also are interested in understanding how the brain works and we wanna do it with the simplest model we can use that still captures the essence of what's happening. So we take ideas from these simple models, um, but, we, but we make little modifications where we think it's important. So here's an example of where um, I, uh, we want to have a network now that we want to we want to explain why uh, primary visual cortex in a mammal, including us, why the neurons behave they do and why they why the neurons uh, respond to the certain visual features that they respond to. And the idea is that we stuck in actual spiking neurons, not just those simple ones that just have a number. Um, they're still pretty simple. This is far simpler than a biological neuron, but but it has more biological realism than. Um, than the uh, than the ones that just have a just have a number representing their activity, and we have local learning rules. Um, I'm not going to show those in great detail, but I'll just say that, um, and I'll but I'll explain in the next slide what I mean by local. Um, here's my sort of cartoon of my network. It's actually not a deep net. It only has one layer after the input layer. The input layer is just going to be the pixel values on on the image, just how bright and dark, just tells you what the activity is, and then the connections given by these blue guys. Um, those are going to be learned by rules that I'm not showing you explicitly. I'm not showing you the math, but the basic idea is this. Um, the neural networks that we that you know about or that you, you hear about in the news that give rise to all those uh, fabulous things in, in a couple slides ago, like identifying cats in photos or beating a Go master or, or making images out of text uh, and chat GPT, those aren't actually physically built networks. They're simulated on computers. And that means that you can have learning rules. You can train them up doing things that you can't do in a real brain or in a robot, for, for that matter, that has an actual physical circuit like this. Uh, and what I'm getting at is that in order to figure out what the strength ought to be for the connection between this neuron and that neuron, to learn that weight, you'd have to know all the connection strengths everywhere else in the network at that moment in time, but that's just not biologically available to, to a little piece of tissue over here. It doesn't know all the connection strengths everywhere else. So we devised, uh, and when I say we, it's mostly uh, Jill Zilberberg, a past student in the group who came up with this idea, local learning rules that don't require you to know that in order to train this network up. Um, and as a result, it actually turned out to be, um, oh, and I should say, the network also does a nice thing. It's very efficient. It only has a few active neurons at a time to represent the input. So rather than training it just to get the answer right with labeled data, 
What we do instead is say we want to use an unsupervised approach that says we want as efficient a representation as possible because we think that's a principle that's relevant to how the brain works. Um, in fact, what I really quick, I'll give you a cartoon. What I mean, if I show you an image like this and I ask him, see a cartoonist, say, hey, could you really quickly, efficiently represent this image? And I say, I'm going to, I'm only going to give you 20 seconds, go. Um, what the cartoonist would do is draw a line drawing that represents the edges along uh, the parts that separate the, um, well, that outline the objects, but in, in a, at a really low level, just in terms of the image, separate the light regions from the dark region. That's that's essentially what you might imagine, and that's what that's what a cartoonist would do. That's an efficient way to go. It turn and it and that produces edges, right? That's how you'd represent the image. Turns out that in our brains, just as in a monkey's brain, if you look in the V1, the first visual area. Many of the neurons, which are represented by each of these little each of this each of these little squares, is a a part of the visual world that excites that neuron. That's what the neuron represents. Well, what you see here is an oriented, uh, local oriented edge. That's an edge right there. And in fact, neurons in your brain, your primary visual cortex, do what a cartoonist does. They actually represent the visual scene by finding the edges in the image and only neurons that are representing that edge light up. So very few are active. That's why it's very efficient. Anyhow, um, the network I was talking about a minute ago does a great job of capturing this, of predicting this without putting lots of biology in. We just put a couple facts in like spiking neurons and the fact that we have a hierarchical, well, it's only one layer, it's not even hierarchical, and that we have um, uh, and then we have a neural net instead of some other kind of a computer. Um, and we have a principle of efficiency and we and we uh, uh, we wind up getting pretty good fits to the data. And it's biologically plausible. This is the first example of this kind of a network that the brain actually could do. It could actually behave this way. Um, and it makes a bunch of predictions. And I'm just going to give you a quick laundry list without getting into details. Um, I already told you that the features, those little edge detectors, those are good predictions, and we know that that's supported by real data from the brain. Um, it turns out that the activity, the, the, the distribution of activity turns out to follow the same function for, for some data that's been measured, but that's the, the jury is still out. People have to make more measurements to see if we're right or not, um, um, which is real predictions. That's one thing I like about it. It's real theory. We don't know the answer when we're looking at this. We get some prediction experimental as well for, for right or not. Um, same thing for the weight distribution. Um, uh, and there's a, a few other things too. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll mention one more of these, which is that I didn't mention the fact that neurons in our brains actually tend to come in one of two signs. Either they excite neurons that they talk to, or they tend to make them, uh, they inhibit them and prevent them from being more active. It turns out that our model sort of explains, well, it does explain it, whether or not it's the right explanation for the brain is we have to still figure out, but it does give an explanation for why there's more excitatory than inhibitory neurons. Anyhow, so um, so that's a in a nutshell, examples going in both directions. Um, and I just wanted to say that I'm going to give one more example going the other way uh, in cartoon form, which is that engineers saw our 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 theory. And then decided to build actual hardware, and this is a little schematic of the hardware, to implement this in a real network that a physically built thing for, for doing what our visual system does, even though that wasn't our main goal with that project. Our goal was to understand how the brain works. Anyway, the work was done by these three people right here, Joel Zimmerberg, Jason Murphy, and Paul King, and here's some other folks in our lab, and, these, uh, and here's some folks that uh, paid for it. You know, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. That was that was illuminating. I really enjoyed your um, your introduction, where where you illustrate how the real biological neurons in our brain um, inspired the statistical models that are these artificial neural networks. So, so I think we have time for a couple of questions before we we move to our next speaker. So, um, has studying these biological neural networks helped you design better artificial ones? Yeah, so a lot of the theory we do, which is it's actually very mathematical. So I didn't, I thought it may not work too well for a short talk. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have taken ideas um, from uh, from areas of statistics and physics to study neural networks, 
artificial neural networks and say why they work so well. Because, I mean, it's obvious that deep networks work extremely well and other kinds of similar networks, but most of how they were discovered it was just trial and error. Um, there's a few good ideas like, yeah, let's take a derivative and then minimize the thing that, you know, minimize the error it's making or something. But but does that explain how you can identify a cat in a photograph? I mean, that's a really complicated function. And we don't really understand the structure of these networks once they're trained up, even though we have an idea why why the learning rules work the way they do. And we all and so so the short answer is yes, we we definitely um study that and we do it um it turns out that most people have heard of linear regression fitting a line to data it turns out that there's a well-developed theory called of kernel regression that underpins that um basic idea of fitting a line and it's more general than just fitting lines it's for fitting other kinds of functions it turns out that there's a way to directly map um deep neural networks onto kernel regression and so we can use the, the machinery from statistics that we know about how, um, how to do kernel regression well to design better neural networks, um, at least in principle. It turns out it's, it's very complicated. It, the math is hard, but it's actually the, the first inroad I've seen toward a real theory that allows you to, to say, OK, if I want to find cats in photos and I want to and I want to. Um, and this is what the statistics looks like of my natural scenes and my photographs, then I can say from that, not just from trial and error, but based on a calculation, here's the type of nonlinearity I need in my network. Here's how many layers I want my network to have. It tells you what the architecture ought to be, um, at least in principle. It's There's still bugs to be worked out. But anyway, so yeah, that's one thing that we also like to do. Very nice. And I think one um, one last question before we move to our next speaker is you've done very general work on the methodology and theory of, of AI. And, and I'm just curious if you can mention to us a few of the other fields to which um, the methods developed in your lab have been used. So, so today we focused on, on, on neuroscience, but if you have examples. So it briefly, yeah. So yeah, the I I the thing is we haven't done so much applications of AI to big data sets, which I think is where most scientists are using AI. They use it as a tool to analyze large data sets. Um, we haven't done so much of that. And most of our theory has been in the form of developing first principles. Like we're treating it like a scientific question. Um, although it's, but I will say this, we have developed one tool that's really good for fitting um, models to data. And it's, uh, and it, it, for a while anyway, it was the record, like it was the fastest way of fitting what's called Ising models. Um, uh, but anyway, it, the, so we have developed some tools that have been useful for scientists fitting um, um, data to, uh, uh, sorry, fitting models to data. Um, but for the most part, we're focused on um, coming up with theory to, to that can be used by other people to find the tools they want for the particular data they'd like to understand. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a terrific presentation. Um, we'll have time at the end for rejoin your question about Mike's talk and, and our next talk. So our, our next speaker is um, Professor Wei Zheng Zhu. Uh, Wei Zheng is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science. His research focuses on understanding earthquake physics and statistics by applying cutting edge artificial intelligence and scientific computing methods to gain new insights from large seismic data sets. He applies deep learning to detect hidden earthquake signals from large seismic data sets and to understand complex earthquake sequences and fault zone structures. Recent developments in deep learning have significantly improved earthquake monitoring, enabling rap rapid and accurate detection of many more small earthquakes with better constrained source parameters. He applies a new deep learning based workflow to study complex earthquake sequences, including tectonic, induced, and volcanic earthquake. Wei Zhang, please tell us about your research. Thank you, thank you. Let me share my screen. 
So can you see my screen one? Yeah. So hello everyone, I'm Wei Changzhu. I'm very happy to join this event. So I will discuss the applications of deep learning in seismology. So for people not familiar with deep learning, it is basically deep neural networks that uh, Mike just introduced. And as we know, large earthquakes are destructive and deadly. They are generated by the sudden movements of four planes, which release a huge amount of energy and they radiate out of sudden waves. And these wave waves will cause strong ground shaking and damage to buildings. Even in this year, we have seen several deadly earthquakes occur around the world. And the earthquakes are also not far from us. In 1968, an earthquake about magnitude 7 occurred on the Hayward Fort, which is near the Berkeley campus and caused significant damage. So in seismology, we analyze these recorded seismic waveforms to study how these large earthquakes occur in order to better, better understand earthquake risk. And the number of large earthquakes is limited, which is a good thing, but it also makes understanding complex earthquake behavior a challenging task. But on the other side, we have many more small earthquakes. So this is a screenshot from the USGS website. In just one month period, there are over 10,000 small earthquakes that occur in the US. And most of these earthquakes cannot be felt by human, but they can be recorded by very sensitive seismometers. And although these earthquakes are very small, they are useful because they occur on the same force as the bigger ones and follow, following similar physical laws. So studying these small events may help us understand how the big ones occur. And the earthquake number follows a power law at this orange line shows, which is known as the gutenberg richter law in seismology. So this means that if we reduce earthquake magnitude by one unit, we can detect about 10 times more smaller earthquakes. But you can also see from these blue columns of the detected earthquake, they do not exactly follow the orange line at the small magnitudes. One reason is that the counter algorithms are not very effective at detecting these small earthquakes. So there are still orders of more earthquakes hidden in seismic data sets. And we can think of these small earthquakes as the dark energy in seismology. Their signals are very weak to detect, but it contains useful information to analyze earthquake activities and the risks. Then how can we detect these small earthquakes? We cannot open the earth to, to take a picture of them. So in seismology, we use a similar technique as remote sensing, but we use it to look down instead of look up. Similar to, to astronomy that use improved telescopes to detect electromagnetic waves from stars in order, in order to look deep into the universe, seismology uses dense seismic networks to listen to the seismic waves radiate out from earthquakes. And in the past few decades, we can see the seismic network become much denser, and we have seen many new faults delineated by these earthquakes. But as we deploy more and more seismic stations, the seismic data volume is, is growing exponentially. And we now also have some new sensing technology, distributed, dis, uh, dis, distributed acoustic sensing does. It can turn a telecommunication cable into thousands of sensors. So that can achieve a very high spatial resolution using the, the cables, but it also produces terabytes of data per day. So this large data volumes requires the development of very efficient algorithm, algorithms to process and extract useful information from seismic data sets. But detecting these like very small magnitude events is not an easy task. The left figure shows 10 hours, 10 hours of seismic data after a major earthquake. As you can see, there are hundreds of small earthquakes that occur during this, this short period. It is very challenging to detect this, uh, all these seismic signals, especially those with very low signal noise ratios. So we still need a human analysis to check many of these waveforms. So you can imagine this is a very time consuming job and it is almost impossible for human analysis to comprehensively process the data sets we have. So to solve these challenges in earthquake monitoring, we explored a new deep learning approach, in, in particular deep learning. The deep learning is currently the state-of-art algorithm for artificial intelligence, and the deep learning models are almost everywhere in our daily life. So they are used to recognize objects in your image, understand your, your voice, and read articles or te and the textbooks. 
In other words, making the machine able to see, listen, and read like human beings. And as a seismologist, definitely I'm most excited to explore if deep learning can also help us to study earthquakes. For example, reading the seismograms and detecting hidden small earthquakes. So to address the big data change in seismology, we have developed several deep learning algorithms for both seismic data and the new dust data. For seismic data, we de develop a deep learning model, FaceNet, and for dust data, we developed the FaceNet dust model. So the FaceNet model uses a U-shape architecture with a sequence of uh, neural network layers to take this raw waveform as input and predict the seismic uh, phase arrivals. So here, the blue color is the P wave uh, wave arrival, the compression wave first arrival, and the red color is the S, S wave, the shear wave uh, first arrival. So these arrival time measurements contains important information of earthquake location and also subsurface velocity uh, structures. So after training on many manual labels picked by Ennis, FISNA is able to accurately pick the both P and S arrivals. And the same applies to the FISA dust model, but the challenge for the dust data is it is a relatively new technology, so we do not have labeled the data for training. So it will be very time consuming and expensive to collect many many labels. So we trained the FISA dust model using a semi-supervised learning approach to transfer the FIS picking capability from seismometer to the new dust data. So now we can also effectively detect the earthquakes and the pick sudden phases using the dust data. And then to explore the potential of these new deep learning models, we have applied them to study many earthquake sequences in both the US and around the world. So here, here are examples uh, of four different types of earthquake, tectonic earthquake, mostly dense aftershock sequence after a major earthquake, and induced earthquakes, which are mostly induced by wastewater injection during energy production, and also deep earthquakes with a depth of several hundred kilometers in the Earth's mantle, and also volcanic earthquakes during volcanic unrest. And in due time, I'll just show one example of volcanic earthquake in Hawaii. So it's very interesting that in recent years, there are significant increase of earthquake frequency on the May, May, May Island of Hawaii as you can see from this his histogram. And most of these earthquakes are very small and occur deep beneath a place called Pahala as shown by these uh, blue dots. So it's very important to understand why these deep earthquakes occur and their connection to the volcanoes of Hawaii. However, from this routine earthquake catalog, we cannot get a clear picture to answer these questions. So we applied the deep learning workflow to process the recent three years of data from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory Southern Network. And the results, uh, the, 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 the results of the enhanced earthquake catalog present us a high, re high resolution 3D view of the seismicity beneath Hawaii. So these colored dots are all earthquakes occurred at different depths. In a shallow, like five kilometer depths, we can see cluster of earthquakes near Mauna Loa and Kilauea, the two large volcanoes of Hawaii. And at a depth about 10 kilometers, we can see clearly the layer of decorum between the vo volcanic edifice and also the uh, and the underlying oceanic crust. Then at a deep depth of 30 to 40 kilometers, we can see the large cluster of the deep seismicity, probably related to the supply of magma. And generally, this picture looks similar to the cartoon researchers have drawn. And now we have a much more detailed picture and also the, this new uh, Pahala swarm. So let's uh, zoom in to take a, a closer look at this, uh, this earthquake swarm. This animation gives a more detailed view of this Pahala swarm. So you can clearly see multiple seal structures probably related to the intrusion process of magma or hydrothermal fluids at very deep. And the, this whole seal complex ex extends about 10 kilometers, and we can see clearly sheets of seismicity. Each one is about a, a few kilometers long. And this seal complex is also pretty deep in the mantle at about 40 kilometers, with a dipping angle of like, uh, like 25 degrees. So this high resolution picture demonstrates that combining the very dense seismic network we have and also the powerful deep learning algorithms, it is a very effective way to help us to detect many small earthquakes and also imaging the detailed subsurface uh, structures. 
So with, with this, these algorithms we have developed, we can now build a new deep learning based workflow to con convert these continuous sonic waveforms into an enhanced earthquake catalog and gain insights into the underlying physical process. And especially deep learning and artificial intelligence are now developing rapidly. So hopefully we can use all this new technology to build an AI seismologist to automatically uh, process the large sudden data sets we have to uncover the hidden signals to study earthquake and also mitigate the potential earthquake damage. So I think seismology is a very exciting field, uh, exciting application field for to explore the potential of AI for scientific discovery. So if you are interested to learn more about the algorithm we have developed, please visit the GitHub page of AI for EPS. And I'll stop here and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Weizhang. That was a really interesting presentation. So um, a few questions for you. So um, of the various uses that you've applied online for applying deep learning uh, methods, so quick risk, false structure, which um, do you think holds the greatest promise for seismology? Uh, which, which two do you mention? The, you, you've illustrated various uses for deep mm -hmm. learning techniques. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering which of these various applications you think holds the greatest promise for seismology? I think it, you have uh, to choose, right? <laughs> uh, I think currently for data mining, for scientific data mining, deep learning is a very promising technique because all these algorithms can scale up uh, efficiently. So we can, for human analysis, we if we spend like we'll get we can easily get tired of looking at many data, but for all these machinery models, we can apply to them to efficiently process all these data sets that we have. I think this is probably the kind of the the most exciting application like potential of AI I can see. Then from these new signals for seismology, we can further look deep into what the like physical process are behind all these signals. Thank you. Thank you. And um, another question. So does AI have a potential role enabling, uh, in enabling high magnitude earthquake prediction or improving early alerts like the ones you get on my shape? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. So as a seismologist that we all want to like predict earthquake one day or forecast earthquake uh, probability like the more accurately. So there are two, so commonly we talk about two things. One is for earthquake forecasting, which means given the current seismicity or all the geolo geological information we have, we will try to better estimate the future earthquake probability. So for AI, definitely it can help us to get more information from data. And with an enhanced catalog, I think we can apply it to better model the earthquake risk so that we can pr provide a better forecasting capabilities. And this is still the current, I think, the uh, frontier of research. Then the other thing we also talk about is we do not forecast the earthquake, but we want to uh, alert people as, as as fast as possible after an earthquake happened. So I think many people have downloaded the app called MyShake. So it's uh, the goal of the, the, the app is, is after we detect an earthquake, we want to send out the alerts as soon as possible, like a few seconds after the earthquake, to people give give people warning that to uh, drop cover and hold on. So for this part, currently we are testing how these uh, new machinery models can help. Like two things: one, detect the earthquake uh, faster and also more accurately, because we want to differentiate between like false uh, false signals and the true earthquake signals, and also how to get the magnitude information more. Actually, so that we know which, like, how large area we want to send out the alert to. I think for both directions, AI can have many applications yeah. and still under like a lot of research now. Definitely. And we have a related question from um, Dennis Meister. I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly in the chat. So the question from Dennis is: How long before you think the models will have learned enough? 
and can be deployed as inference engines to accurately and accurately in quote, right? So is learn enough um, to predict serious events. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, a so, question, I realize. <laughs> so I think this country, I think one reason people get very excited about all these large deep neural networks and the the things we observe now is the more data we feed the model and the more computing we spend on training the models, the performance can can keep increasing, but maybe at a decreased like the rate. So, which means there are still a lot of potential to improve the current performance of these all these deep learning models. And even at the current performance, I think for earthquake forecasting, maybe it's still very challenging. But for like weather forecasting and uh, whether now casting or other forecasting uh, task, the machine learning models has already achieved similar performance as the conventional numerical simulation way. And at a, uh, I think at a fast speed and uh, relative similar accuracy, but, but as I mentioned, the performance of these deep learning models can still in, improve. Kind of one challenge for these deep learning models is how to quantify, uh, like quantify the uncertainties of their predictions. We have very powerful models. They can give us many predictions. Then if we, we get like, we, we have several models that give us similar or dissimilar uh, predictions. How can we know how confident are all these, uh, are, are these models? And I think this part is like, may need like more research. But I'm, I'm pretty op uh, op optimistic about all these powerful models. Thank you, Weijang. So um, with the time we have left uh, for today's event, I would like to invite both of our speakers back so, for some last um, questions. So, so Mike and uh, Weijang. So we had a, a general question that was asked right after Mike's talk, and I think um, I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are about that. So this is a question from Rosette Dawson about chat box. So why do chat box not work well? Um, I, I have never been helped by one and still need a human tech to solve my issues. Is there a way to beg the chat box to connect me to a human? I don't, try that, Mike? <laughs> I don't think I have anything smart to say about that. I, I mean, talking to a human's a trick, uh, but I don't, um, I guess real fast, I'll just say that I think it depends on how, you know, I think most chat box are, are better at answering some questions than others. And if you can figure out how to ask the right question, half of it's like, it's like any other tool, you know, you, you learn what it's good for and, and how to, how to use it. Um, I don't use them very much myself. So I, I don't, I don't have practical advice. But. Uh, I can add a few. So I use yeah, all the chat box mm -hmm. quite often in my research. So I think kind of the limitation for the chat box is it. Uh, so like for human, we have multiple perceptions like vision, audio, uh, vision and uh, audio and also reading. So but for chat box, it, it kind of is mainly for text, like for questions, Q&As. And definitely we want to add more different inputs, like a multi-modality inputs for all these chatbot, so that it can not only see your questions, but maybe also read all the related information about your like pictures, photos about your uh, question. I think this country, all these chatbots are developing very fast. So I think they will add more capability to these chatbots. And for, in my research, I use it a lot in like, uh, uh, in my coding and programming part, hmm. because it's, I think because all these chatbot data are trained on large database of, of coding like uh, uh, codes. So they are actually pretty good at uh, provide a very uh, like um, help to my coding process because a lot of, uh, I think they can, I think their su suggestions are quite accurate now. But I hope one day it can also help us do like more scientific discoveries. Like if I have an idea, if the chatbots can help me quickly go through all the data and find the related important information I can look at, then that's going to be even more helpful. Right. Thank you. So, so next I'll go back to a question that I asked um, at the beginning of the panel. So it was, how do we define AI? So I realized AI means 
many things to many people. So I'm just curious how, in a few words or sentences, how do you each define AI? Maybe a start. Um, sure, thank you, Mike. I, so I feel like currently what AI is, uh, the most powerful, well, so I think it's defined by its most powerful current in, in you know, incarnation. Right now, the most powerful stuff takes enormous amounts of data and finds structure there. Um, and um, it, it, the reasoning it does is it, it isn't reasoning yet. So I feel like currently. Mike, you're muted. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> In a, in, a, in a single sense, I was just saying that I think the AI is defined by its most powerful current form. What currently is the most powerful stuff is, are these algorithms that look at enormous data sets and can extract structure from it. Um, and I think as opposed You got muted again. I got muted. Somebody's muting me, I think. but. Um, who could blame them? Anyway, so I guess my answer is currently I would define it as huge data mining, finding structure from a giant corpus of data. Um, that's currently the way AI works. Um, maybe in the future it will be more reasoning and clever. I don't know. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I agree. I think kind of we define AI like is a way to how to mimic human intelligence that's why i call it artificial intelligence so like for human we have a lot of unique capability right to learn and the memory and also to reasoning and to have create creativities then we also want to build a, like a smarter machines can at least have similar capability as a human for example to read all the or like help us solve problems read all our our literature and find the important information like to reason as humans and then but all these machines like uh, since we do not uh, simply copy our brain we are using more like uh, many learning algorithms to make the machines to learn more efficiently and be more more powerful and the more is especially all the machines can scale up uh, like they can scale up so they can we have you more man, many gpus many servers so this like i think this like ai can that's why I think the AI can maybe become even achieve superhuman performance like with a lot of data, data training and a lot, a lot of computing. Right, right. So, so, so in, thank you very much for these, um, these thoughts. So in your talk, you're focused mostly um, in the positive aspects of AI, how AI enables your research, but we hear a lot these days about concerns of AI being adverse uses of AI, adverse impacts of AI. So in your specific fields, fields, do you have any concerns about the use of AI? So back to me. Um, sure. I don't, whoever wants to speak first, yeah. So <laughs> in my field, I don't, I'm, I'm less concerned about the stuff I'm directly working on. I think, I think there's lots of this public discussion about potential downsides of, of AI. Some fall in the form of, well, it's going to take away opportunities from people because people don't need to do the work anymore. Um, and then the other negative thing I hear is, of course, everyone, as ever we all hear, um, is that you know machines at some point might be our adversaries, right? I think, I mean, you know, I was surprised how quickly machines beat humans go. So I'm not a great predictor. Things have happened faster than I expect, uh, but um, there are anyway. Obviously, there's a there's a downside if if machines have access to things that affect, you know, you know, pe people in cars or people in, you know, airplanes or whatever. Um, I think a lot of thought has to be put into uh, fail safes and things like that, um, just as you do for humans uh, controlling those things. Yeah. To me, yeah. To me, I think currently the. My feeling for AI is very similar to when we start to use computers for uh, computers in research. So before computers, we do a lot of research by like by drawing and by handwriting. But now with computers, we definitely for doing research, our efficiency increase a lot. I I I think the same thing will apply to all these AI technologies. 
So they are a very efficient tools to help to us do like data processing research more efficiently. But I think since the models that their capability are, are become uh, improving rapidly, so that's why I think there are also concerns for AI safety and all these issues. But I'm I'm not an expert on AI safety, so I'll I'll trust my colleagues from computer science, electrical engineering to address all these AI safety issues. But definitely we want to investigate more to understand all these models better. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So, so this hour went by really, really quickly and I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to address all the terrific questions um, that were asked in the chat. So um, I'd like to thank you both, uh, Wei Zhang and Mike for your terrific presentation and the audience for their question. Um, so to close, I'm going to hand the floor back to Dean Bachin. Thank you, uh, Professor Dudois, for moderating, and thanks to Professor Duisi and Zhu for a compelling presentations. I witnessed a lot of change in my career, and the advances in AI are some of the most profound, both in terms of power and adaptability. Tonight, we heard from two experts that covered um, many fields, actually, uh, but there is no corner of our college that will uh, go untouched by AI. It is really uh, a remarkable time to be a scientist at UC Berkeley. This was the third installment in our fall season of Basic Science Lights the Way. I hope you'll join us for our final conversation on Wednesday, December 6th, uh, when we'll, we will be discussing the future of biology and public health. I, I myself will be joining that panel uh, alongside uh, Michael Liu, the Dean of the School of Public Health. We will be exploring some big topics that have dramatic impacts on your health. So even putting aside my vested interest as a panelist, I expect that there will be a lot to gain from attending. Please reach out again uh, if you'd like to learn more about anything we've covered and we'll be sharing additional resources with you. Uh, by email about today's topic, and speakers and a video of today's session will be available at, uh, at our Basic Science Lights the Way website approximately a week from now. Uh, you can always return to the Basic Science Lights the Way website to watch episodes you missed. Thank you for attending and showing such interest in this topic. We couldn't do our work without you, our audience, your attention and support. Until the next time, stay curious and fiat lux, and of course, go bears. <laughs>